we'll get started. We have about 12 people on Zoom and seven people on Sir John. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, a couple little housekeeping things. I wanted to quickly mention that we're putting out applications in early next year for the leadership committee. So if you know any residents that are going to be fellows next year that are interested in kind of contributing to the direction of where the virtual education series goes, um, please keep an eye out for that as well as we are putting out an application for an intern. Um, so ideally someone who's either a research resident or a current resident that wants to participate and kind of get involved with visual abstracts, um, things like that. And with that, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Jennifer Davids, who is one of my uh, mentors. She's currently an associate professor of surgery at the University of Massachusetts, where she completed her fellowship training in 2013. Prior to fellowship, she did her general surgery residency at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Her clinical practice is focused entirely on colorectal surgery and really runs the full gamut of benign and malignant diseases with a focus on minimally invasive techniques, including laparoscopy, robotics, endoscopy, and transanal approaches. She has served as the Associate Program Director of the UMass General Surgery Residency for five years and is now the Colorectal Fellowship Program Director. Her major longitudinal research focus is on the experience of female physicians, particularly surgeons, and is really committed to breaking barriers to equity and career advancement at every stage. Her work ranges from evaluating the impact of pregnancy, maternity, and lactation on early career physicians to identifying and addressing implicit biases in professional settings. She also serves on the editorial board for clinics of colon and rectal surgery, as well as techniques of coloproctology, and is an associate examiner for the ABCRS and ASCARS Executive Council member. She's a Massachusetts native. She's married to an academic oncologist, has two children, and in March, she will be heading to Boston Medical Center to become chief of their division of colorectal surgery. Uh, so with that, um, Dr. Jennifer Davids, take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Susie Hill, and you'll see why in my talk, I'm going to use your formal title as an introduction. Um, thank you all for joining. Um, and um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak on something that I think affects our day to day life. Um, and I think is a good complement to your curriculum in colon and rectal surgery. So we already heard a little bit about me, but just to give you perspective um, for where I'm coming from. Uh, with everything that you hear in this talk. So I'm in my 10th year of practice. I'm an only child. I'm the only physician in my family. I'm married to an uh, academic medical oncologist who's also the only physician in his family. I'm a mom of two. Emily was born during my research time as a resident and Max was born during my uh, first year in practice. So in terms of my early influences as a surgeon, I'd have to say, you know, there's no one in my family, I've had no personal experiences that brought me closer to surgeons in my family, but these two, Dr. Corday and Benton, which perhaps are before your time or before your generation, but these two are on ER and I was transfixed by these two characters as a teenager, as I was watching this show. And when I thought about surgeons, these two look like a surgeon to me, but now in retrospect, when I think about those early influences, I think how neither of these individuals represents what the typical stereotype is of a surgeon. And I truly do think that this early influence somehow shaped me in my career decision. Forward to being a resident, I just mentioned that I had my daughter during my research years. So here I was as a PGY4 and five in general surgery, with a baby that didn't sleep and my husband's a fellow and it was really a struggle. And I would have to say that part of my inspiration for all of this work in gender equity came from this book that I read during my chief year of residency. And I think that this is, there's so much from this book. I spent hours flipping through it, just looking for one representative quote. But for this, for this talk, I think that this is something that really helped me figure out how I was going to manage my career. We all know you can't have it all, but if you have the appropriate focus, perhaps you can have all that you want. So the key is to learn where to focus your attention. Certain things have to be just right. They get your 100% attention and you all know what those things are relating to your career and to your personal life. But the rest, something's gotta give. And so that's where the concept of good enough emerges. And so this book really shaped me at that critical juncture as I was learning to, I was basically right where you are, just about to take on fellowship with a young child and a dual career family, wondering how I was going to make it work. 
So today we're going to talk about barriers to equity and how to address them for women in, um, in surgery. So I think it's really critical before we get into the meat and potatoes of the talk to define some terms. So these terms are tossed around a lot and I think it's very important to know the difference. So equality is where everybody is treated the same. You're all handed the same mathematics textbook. It's the same distribution of support, opportunities and treatment for everyone. What it, it seems fair on the surface, but the problem is it doesn't account for inherent differences between each member of a group. Equity ensures that there is equality in the outcomes, but not necessarily in the resources, in the amount or in the type. And so what you're actually doing is you're treating according to the differences and not despite the differences. And so what you end up doing, trying to reach equity is allocating resources according to the strengths and in, in, in interests of the individual. So my interpretation of this is a rock band, right? It means that you're allocating the right resources and the right opportunities to the right people to make a team. So you can't have a good rock band with four lead guitarists, right? You have to figure out who has the passion, who is the fit for that, and they get groomed and they get given the resources and so forth. So when I think of a division or a department, I mean, you can use this in any group within medicine or within surgery or beyond, you have to think about building the best rock band. And obviously the resources for each individual are different. So specifically, the, this is the whirlwind tour of things that I think are huge barriers to achieving gender equity and how we can address them. So I'm gonna talk about the barriers and then also ways that we can break down those barriers. We'll talk first about representation, which I think is an important first step. We'll talk about specifics related to pregnancy, maternity leave, lactation. Domestic tasks, who takes out the trash, who pays the bills. Discrimination in the forms of unconscious bias and sexual harassment. We'll also discuss pay disparities. And then lastly, a bucket category that I call pervasive societal expectations. I'll show you a lot of data in this talk and um, also add in my perspective, but I wanted to make sure to acknowledge something very important that I couldn't bring into this talk and, and because of time the concept of other rep underrepresented groups. This, this is really about women versus men or other groups, but we're not talking about different ethnic, racial minorities, uh, different sexual orientations, and the impact that intersectionality or maybe having more than one of those characteristics, how that affects your career. I think that's an entire separate topic. Another topic that I think is very important with regard to gender equity is ergonomics, and again, for another day. So first we'll talk about representation. So you may have heard about the concept of the pipeline. And we know that issues with gender inequity in surgery are not due to a lack of qualified women entering the field. In general surgery, about a third of current trainees are women and about a fifth of practicing surgeons. So you can see there's a change in the trend. And that's only amplified in our specialty of colorectal surgery where almost half of the fellows are women but only one in five or so are full diplomates. So there definitely is improvement. And I think it's really important to acknowledge the changes that have happened over recent years. So currently female chairs of surgery are approximately 10% across the country, rising significantly over a short period of time for only four in 2014 to 26 in 2021. And accordingly, in our special societies, we've seen a rise in female leadership um, in recent years, but still low numbers compared to the duration of the society. So both in the American College of Surgeons as well as in ASCRS. So I have this picture of my daughter as an anecdote. She last year put together this project that she had worked on very hard, uh, showing the different countries and their leaders. So I came home after a late night of work where I did not have the opportunity to help her with this. And I see all men on the poster. And so I asked her where the women were on this. And she said, well, there are none. And then she immediately corrected and said, I just couldn't find them. And I thought that that was a very telling remark about where women stand in leadership, probably across all domains, even beyond medicine. Where are they? So you might think, well, I showed you the trends for improving representation. So maybe if we just passively watch 
more women entering surgery, everything will work itself out. So here's a study by Dr. Abelson that shows um, if you look at the rate of change and apply that prospectively, how long it will take to have equal numbers of surgical subspecialty trainees. And so if you look at colorectal, the prediction, this is a study from 2016. So it's actually two more years is the prediction they made when we would have approximately 50% women colorectal fellows, which sounds pretty accurate to me. At the same time, while we should be very proud of that in our field, if you look at academic rank, there's a sharp contrast here. Whereas it will take 121 years for women to reach 50% with regard to full professor status. So that's the year 2137, and I'd rather not wait that long, I don't know about you. So clearly there are factors here beyond just the infiltration or the pipeline of women entering the field, and that's what we need to explore. So not surprising probably to many listening that women are actively discouraged from pursuing certain, sub, certain surgical specialties. This is a large survey of ACS members. And of all the respondents, only 8% had a female mentor. And even when you looked at the female surgeons that were just a few years into practice, only a quarter of them had any female mentors. And when you asked these individuals, what specialties are good for women? They gave you the answers that you would expect and colorectal is somewhere in the middle. But the point is, is that women are still actively being discouraged from pursuing many specialties. So therefore our representation is fundamentally unequal. This is a concept I heard from Julie Silver who runs the Harvard Women um, Physician Leadership course, which I definitely would encourage any of you to take. It's this concept that she had come across called the inexorable zero. So what does it mean as a woman or as any minority group? When you enter a room or a group or an organization and there are no women present. And what it really shows is it sends this implicit message that you just don't belong there. And an application of this that I've seen is this. So Ruth Bader Ginsburg once said, I'm asked when there'll be enough women on the Supreme Court. And I say, when there will be nine, people are shocked. But had there been nine men, no one's ever raised a question about that. And I think this quote speaks to why the concept of the manal or the all male panel is so inflammatory, why that raised such awareness on social media. And you hear you know, major leaders saying that they won't be part of a manal. Um, and the idea here is, is this is a manifestation of that inexorable zero. So if there are no women on the podium, it just sends this message to all women that they don't belong there. So one of the things I wanted to know in terms of representation is how we do as a society. So in 2017, I went to ASCARS and we sent a whole crew into the meeting to attend the live sessions and to track the program. So looking at representation, so first of all, the attendees of the conference overall were about a third female. And when you look on the surface, the speakers and moderators were close to that. So you could say, well, that's well aligned with the attendance of the meeting. So that seems good, which it is. But then when you look into it a little bit more by topic, you can actually see a huge range in representation of women You know, almost 50% in education, but then all the way down to 17% in techniques and technology. So there certainly isn't an even distribution of women throughout the program. And then when you look even more closely at certain subtopics within the formal program, the percentage of women was very low in rectal cancer, robotics, advanced endoscopy, IBD, and healthcare economics. And you could say, that was just one year. I mean, that you know, it's hard to know the numbers are low overall anyway, which is true. But interestingly, there were a lot of parallels to the ASCARS committee members at that time with very low numbers in IBD, healthcare economics, and new technologies. So I think this represents a hard stop. So when you see problems with representation, it doesn't tell you the why. It just shows you the consequence. So I don't know. I could never conclude is this because women were systematically excluded and denied the opportunity to present or did they decline offers to present or are there 
systemic structural factors that tend to just pervasively discourage women from participating in these topics? I have no idea. The point is, is that I think in order to answer any of those meaningful questions, you have to look at representation first. Improve representation. So the key is to be deliberate. I showed you the pipeline and the issues with that. You're not going to get a very well-balanced program or group unless you're very deliberate about choosing individuals that will be a good complement. So simply inviting women to speak on their area of expertise. Looking beyond your network, if you are assembling a panel or a group and there are no women or no minority individuals on the panel, ask around and keep asking until you find. The point is, is that there are women doing all of these things. It's just a matter of um, being, putting in the effort to make sure that you have the appropriate representation. Something simple that can be done is if you are given a chance to present or speak or any kind of opportunity and you need to decline for whatever reason, deliberately suggest a female colleague. Broadly accommodating families is one of the most important things and that includes the whole member of the family because as you'll see from later data that I will show you, women are more likely to have um, spouses who are surgeons or a physician. So often if you can support the entire family to attend a meeting um, and then ensure that children are cared for and um, that basic lactation needs are met, you'll have a much better representation. Freeing up junior female faculty's clinical obligations, funding their travel ex expenses can allow those barriers to meetings um, to be broken and for attendance to improve because often the reasons why women decline are simple things like these. And then lastly, if you can do nothing else, amplify and engage um, with on social media with some of the work that is being done by women. So one thing I always hear about when talking about representation and women in medicine, women in surgery as well, the women are tearing each other down until the women support each other, why should I support? So there's actually a concept within the business world called the queen bee phenomenon. And this is when you put one woman into the executive leadership. And what happens is there's a natural tendency for anybody in that situation to subconsciously distance themselves from the more junior women in order to gain that much needed acceptance by the male peers. So this is not a cause of underrepresentation, it's a consequence. So how do you fix this? Well, there's this whole concept of more than one. So just be cognizant of it. You know, sometimes it takes more than one woman to say that you've addressed the issue. And then what happens from there, instead of excluding other women or cutting down that pipeline, you're building an intentional culture of inclusion. Having fair, transparent policies, employing women at all levels, and as someone who's in mid-career, I can tell you that there's always a lot of enthusiasm early on for supporting junior women, and then there are people that have achieved tremendous success, but building up the middle of that group who are supporting the juniors and keeping things going is really, really important. And then supporting networking and mentoring. I can't tell you how many women in medicine or women in surgery luncheons or networking events I personally have sponsored or organized and have had men come up to me and say, well, when's the men in surgery luncheon happening? And I totally get that that is an innocent comment, but the point is, is that um, until you recognize the need here specifically for women to network, um, I think th that barrier needs to be broken. So next we'll talk specifically about the constellation that you know, comprises pregnancy, maternity leave, lactation challenges. So very much this work that I will show you was, um, was inspired by my own rock bottom experience, right? Here I am, and this may be you, any of you um, in the near future. My first year of practice, um, I would say my BMI is probably twice what it is now because I have another human already at past 39 weeks. I had told myself that I would stop operating at 39 weeks and I did. This was my last case, but the patient leaked on day six. And so I ended up taking the patient back. And at this point, I just couldn't even believe it. Like I, I just, it was like one of the worst moments of my life. Everything went fine. I moved on. Everybody did well, but I just felt like I can't be the only one having these types of experiences, right? 
And I was lucky to have Dr. Nelia Melnichuk as a close friend from residency and then um, as a peer mentor. And so she and I, I just show you this to show you what many of you are going through currently. So here we are pregnant, taking our written boards, thankful that neither of us went into labor while you know, sitting in the Pearson view. Then when we went to take our oral boards, we had these four slash five month old babies that we were trying to pump and balance all that and the, the, the flight. And then by the time we became diplomates, here we are with these toddlers running around trying to run our practice in our first few years. So the point is, is that you're not alone, but obviously I think there are some structural challenges that women in these positions face. And that's what I wanted to tackle. So I did a survey and it may, maybe some of you are familiar with what is now ginormous physician moms group. It was a lot smaller at the time. And I was able to do, we were able to use Facebook to recruit 1500 women mother, um, physician mothers in practice of which one quarter were in procedural specialties. And we found that the majority did not have any kind of maternity leave included in their job contract. And what we found is in, for women in procedural specialties compared to those in non-procedural specialties, there were greater financial losses associated with um, maternity, negative impact on referrals. And then ultimately all of this led to a stronger desire to choose a less demanding specialty which if you think about all the training you've gone through, that's pretty significant. So we specifically delved into what the issues are regarding breastfeeding and lactation. The biggest issue you can see from the graph was too little time or inflexibility with the schedule. The World Health Organization recommends one year of breastfeeding or pumping. And of this group, over a third did not meet, not necessarily the one year, but not even their own personal goal that they set for themselves. And among surgical trainees specifically, 40% seriously considered leaving surgery altogether. And a third of them discouraged female medical students from pursuing a career in surgery. So here we have the role models inspiring and they're falling apart and they feel like they can't even recommend this to their juniors. Certainly things like wearable gear has helped with this process, but truly what is needed is proactive creation of a lactation policy. Because what you don't want to happen is you have your very first pregnant resident, and now it's personal, it's not a policy. It's like, how, how are we gonna accommodate this one individual? And you can imagine the cultural sense, like how that feels to be that one woman who needs a special allowance made. And none, none of us like that. Whereas if there's already a policy in place, you just enact the policy, there's fairness, there's a plan. No one feels like they're burdening anyone else. So I think the policy automatically leads to a cultural change that is very much needed. So the American College of Surgeons and the American Board of Surgeons have made a lot of progress in supporting residents. This is from um, last year. Essentially, um, you can look it up for the, you know, the granular details, but it allows for six weeks of leave for significant life events. And what I love about this is that it's for men or women, um, or any gender, there's no restriction, and it includes adoption, uh, paternity leave. It's very broad, and the point is it allows for the amount of flexibility that is necessary. Separate story about whether six weeks is appropriate or not for another time. That statement was a really big push. And so you could even argue, you know, well, it's really hard to protect a woman's schedule, especially in practice. How are you going to block out clinic? And OR, well, I would argue that it is financially far worse to lose a woman in early career than it is to make those small allowances in a short period of, for a short period of time. So it costs approximately $1 million to lose a physician and then have to rehire. And that far exceeds the cost to support a parental leave for everyone, adjust schedule for pumping breaks, and to provide dedicated space near the OR. So again, I cannot emphasize enough with regard to how to fix this inequity. It's important to create a policy proactively and make sure everybody's on board before situations arise. So next we'll talk about domestic tasks. So I don't know if anybody can relate. I, for a long time, this was my home office. This is my kitchen. The reason why I'm showing you the clean kitchen is this is how I do my work on a weekend is that I start by cleaning the whole kitchen. Everything has to look great. 
I've got all my work set up. I've got my rose gold laptop. Everything's good. And you can imagine just like clockwork that my kids are up and there's innumerable distractions. I think women tend to put themselves in this environment to try to cater to everybody. I'm taking care of my family. I'm doing work. I'm doing it all, but I'm actually doing absolutely nothing. And it's a huge threat to productivity. And as my kids have gotten older, I will tell you the best thing you can do is get a desktop computer that cannot move in a place that you can close the door. Hard to do when you have babies, but as your kids get older, that is absolutely critical. That's why you're not hearing them in the background right now, because I'm upstairs. So when you think about domestic tasks, I think this graphic shows it all. It's the same distance, but if you have all these additional obstacles to get through, how are you ever gonna make it in an appropriate amount of time? So with regard to parenting and domestic tasks, women are the default parent the majority of the time. And the default parent, I, I like this quote, you'd know the default parent is the one responsible for the emotional, physical, and logistical needs of the children. And it's typically the one with the uterus. So this was a, a survey of 8,000 members of the American College of Surgeons with a pretty robust response rate. And very interestingly, you can see here that women, you know, you might think, you might hypothesize that women are working fewer hours, they're doing these domestic tasks. They're actually not. They're working the same amount of hours and taking the same number of calls as their male colleagues. But here's where the difference lies. The dual physician households are more likely to be from the women surgeons and less from the men. And then when you look at dual surgeon households, the same thing. A third of women that are surgeons have a spouse that is a surgeon, whereas 5% of male surgeons have a female surgeon spouse. And as a consequence, 70% of the men can rely on their spouse when a child gets ill to cover the childcare, whereas only a quarter of women can do so. So what's the consequence of all this? Well, over half of women felt that raising a child slowed their career advancement compared to only 20% of men. So I think that is a staggering statistic. So I wanted to know more granularity with regard to the concept of domestic tasks. So what we did here specifically is we looked at, we provided respondents, we did a survey where we gave a laundry list, no pun intended, of all the domestic tasks you could consider that your typical family might need to do. So what we looked at is um, people who did fewer than five domestic tasks in a typical week comparing to those that do five or more. We also then looked at um, physicians in non-surgical careers versus surgical careers. And there's some interesting results here. So we tried to correlate the performance of multiple domestic tasks with career satisfaction. So overall, um, there was no difference in career satisfaction in the non-surgical group who did tasks, lots of tasks and not. So you might hypothesize that maybe they actually want to do some of these things. There's nothing, there shouldn't be a negative connotation with taking out the trash or paying the bills or doing the repairs in the house. Maybe those in non-surgical careers um, might find some joy in doing those things. Whereas the same is not true in surgical um, respondents here. You can see that there was a significant increase in a desire to switch to a less demanding career for those who were doing a lot of domestic tasks compared to who's, those who weren't. And the overall rate, regardless actually of career dissatisfaction was very high in the group. So the easiest fix to possibly say about this is to actually make a list of all the things that everybody does. It's incredibly important to try to divide these things up equitably and to try to invest in outsourcing. And when I say invest, you're investing in your career. I know that, especially at this juncture, outsourcing things um, may be different from how you were raised. There's that stigma. And it's also like you're paying back your educational debt. But what you're really doing is by paying somebody to do the laundry or whatever it is that you find most onerous, you're actually investing in your career, if that's something that you care about. In the sense that if you don't like doing those things, like I don't, paying somebody to do them may make a big difference for your sanity. So next we'll talk about discrimination specifically in the form of unconscious bias and sexual harassment. So unconscious or implicit bias refers to a subconscious unintentional pervasive belief or stereotype that impacts an individual's action towards certain groups. 
Unconscious biases lead to what's called a microaggression, which is an indirect, subtle, or unintentional discrimination against members of a marginalized group. So the way I like to think about these is, and you definitely know them if you're a woman or you're in any marginalized group. So actively, the easiest description would be just simply being mistaken for somebody that is not in your role, that maybe some has less training. So a phlebotomist or saying, I never saw the surgeon the entire time I was hospitalized when as a surgeon, you have been seeing this patient and introducing yourself as such every day. Things like just basic categorization. We used to have a grand round where somebody would say when the surgeon, when he signs in the patient and the nurse, and then she double checks the, the wristband. Um, those types of generalizations can be considered microaggressions. Passive examples are just merely being overlooked. I remember going to Asgard's as a junior faculty, a large session just got out and you know those little semicircle um, groups of people that congregate and maybe you know somebody and people could join the group and there's introductions. And I remember being in a group of maybe seven or eight people and a new person comes in and somebody said, oh, do you know these people? And literally each person was introduced in a handshake. And when it came to me, that person just never said anything, like never introduced me. And the only way I can describe how that feels, it almost makes you feel like you're shrinking in your own space or that you're just invisible. And once it happens, right? Somebody gets distracted, no big deal. But the point is when you are a member of a marginalized group, this happens on a minute to minute, hour to hour, multiple times a day um, event. And those types of microaggressions can have a cumulative negative effect on how you see yourself and how others view you. So I became intrigued by these microaggressions and wanted to try to quantify them. So at that same 2017 meeting in Askars, I sent a whole crew um, with Dr. Melnichuk, we, we sent a bunch of our um, team members to every session that we could possibly go to. And we tracked the sessions to determine how the moderators were introducing the speakers. So we looked at the gender of the moderator and the gender of the speaker. And we wanted to know, was the speaker introduced by their formal introduction, like Dr. Jennifer Davids or doctor, or informal, which would mainly be Jennifer, Jen, any kind of first name only type introduction. So what we found is that overall 58% of speakers were introduced using a formal introduction and women were more likely than men to use the formal introduction when they were a moderator. The real difference existed here. Women, there was no major difference, no statistically significant difference in the way they introduced female or male speakers but for men, they were twice as likely to introduce a male speaker in a formal professional fashion compared to a female speaker. And you know, I felt like this was very striking. And there are many different potential reasons. One of the criticisms of this work was, well, the women tend statistically to be more junior and therefore that might be a confounder that wasn't accounted for. I would also argue you're on the podium at, at this point, this was a tripartite meeting. This is an international meeting. If there's ever a time to be equal or to be formal, this would be it. So we intentionally didn't account for that because I think that it actually doesn't matter that much. So what happened with this? And one of the cool things that happened, happened organically from my perspective. So I presented this on the podium and then we published the work. And then for the 2019 meeting, Brian Kahn was a program, uh, program chair and he sent out this email to all session moderators and essentially cites the work that we did and said, you can introduce formally or informally, but the key is please be consistent in the manner with which you introduce the speakers. And that's all that was said was just one email that went through. And then what I wanted to know is, did it work? Like did that email and did the work that we did have any impact on the following year? So this is where Dr. Hill joined our, our, our team as a research fellow and got to participate in, the, in this work. And so we went for the subsequent year and did the same thing on a subset. So we went to roughly one third of the sessions. And what we actually found is that you would imagine people were more likely to use formal introductions of speakers, 82% versus 58%. 
but the disparity with the fem the uh, male moderators introducing women was gone. So it actually made a difference. And I think that a lot of the female speakers, again, tend to be more junior. This may be their first opportunity on the podium. I'd like to think that this creates an environment of equity. I do think that words matter and providing a sense of inclusion to everybody makes a difference. So you might think this is limited to medicine and this is our problem, our culture in medicine, but it's not. Go all the way to the top to the Supreme Court. It was actually noted that the female Supreme Court justices were more likely to be interrupted than their male colleagues. And they actually had to track this just like we did and make an intervention. So there's a specific protocol now where the oral argument rules were revamped um, to allow for women to have the opportunity to speak without being interrupted more than their male peers. So what do you do, right? So what do you do with these microaggressions? So a lot of people, you can imagine, I gave this talk grand rounds at my institution and for weeks people would come up to me with um, different examples of microaggressions and say like, did I do the right thing? What do you think? Um, which actually I enjoyed because it's much harder than you think. It's easy for me to get up here and tell you what to do. But these are my reflections on best practices. So the key thing that you can do if you feel that you are the victim of a microaggression or a group you belong to is, or you're witnessing this, it's really important not to assume negative intent. I will say from the perspective of a woman who has you know, felt this, sometimes what happens is they're additive and it's like some little slightly kind of off color remark just makes you want to explode. And what you have to do is have that perspective and understand the point of view of the under, other person who I would assure you almost definitely did not know the impact of what they're saying. So I would say a, appropriate time and place. You have to really just take a deep breath and think about whether it needs to be addressed in the time and place or elsewhere. And that's a hard question to answer. But I would say if it has to be addressed at that moment at the meeting when it's happening, just a simple clarification, rather than tearing somebody down, just saying, could you repeat that? What did you mean by when you said this? Or, you know, if you do need to take somebody aside, for instance, we had a male resident that presented something in a grand rounds that I thought was disparaging toward female colleagues and female surgeons. I actually had to do the, this is how I feel, which is really hard as surgeons, but I actually had to say, when you presented this thing, this is how I actually felt. And believe it or not, like you can't make any progress in our culture unless you share with people how you feel. So I would encourage all of you to do that. Just even attending this talk and talking about it will build awareness of these issues, amplifying these issues. And then again, if you are not part of a marginalized group, but you witness something, be what's called an upstander, somebody that speaks up and says, you know, I, you know, that's actually our chief resident. That's not a medical student. This person has a lot of training stick up for those who are marginalized and that will go a long way. That will make us all better. And then there are ways to do bias training. And so certainly if you want to bring these types of concepts to a large group, there's no better way to do it. So we'll talk briefly about sexual harassment, which probably could and should be its own topic. We all know it disproportionately impacts women over men and causes victims ultimately to question their accomplishments. So if you're a woman that has built up your career and you have a mentor and then something happens, you're gonna then wonder, have I achieved what I achieved because of my own accomplishments or because of somebody's personal interest in me in a different way? The Me Too movement, I think was in many ways a double-edged sword for the culture of medicine because on one hand, it empowered women to speak out openly, which is obviously a huge amount of progress but it definitely had a backlash in terms of men being very concerned about mentoring women. All of a sudden, people are afraid to close doors. They're afraid of going out to dinner. People will say things like, treat your female colleague like you would your wife. Well, actually, no, that's terrible advice. That's your romantic partner. So you wanna treat women like your colleague, not your wife. And so it, I actually think where we are now is I think we're in a better place because all of us, we've had this conversation, but I wanna highlight that. So there was a big survey at the AB site and the one limitation was that they didn't define sexual harassment, but what they did find women were more likely to, to, to report having been sexually harassed. Um, and it did correlate with burnout. Another study that I found, I think, was a little bit more granular because they actually gave, as you can see by the chart, specific definitions of types of sexual harassment. 
And 70% of the women reported experiencing this compared to only 30% of the men, but still 30% of men were experiencing this. Only 7% reported uh, sexual harassment because A, they thought, well, you know, was that even, they're not even sure, or maybe it was just harmless, maybe I shouldn't overreact. Or most importantly, people were afraid of being, of retaliation. If you're in training, you're in a very vulnerable position and your career and your future is on the line. So do you report or do you just suck it up and let the culture perpetuate? That's a tough position. So I would argue the way to break this barrier is to have policies in place for safe reporting and open dialogue. Next, we'll talk about pay disparity. Did you know that there are no medical specialties where women are paid the same amount as men or more? So the overall wage gap between men and women in medicine is 28%. So you can see this proximity study uh, that shows the largest pay gap, which alarmingly for OBGYN, there are 57% women in that field, yet the men make way more money. And we can be proud, I suppose, that in colorectal surgery, we're in the list of smallest pay gap, which is great. However, I don't know about you, but I don't know anybody that wants to earn $55,000 less per year. So this clearly shows that there's an issue. So this is one of the most elegant studies I've seen looking at the pay gap issue. So this is a study of 10,000 physicians in 24 public state medical schools. They just compared male salary, female salary, and it was $50,000. So you say, well, that's because of all the different things that women do. They're taking care of their kids. They're working less. Well, actually, they adjusted for all of those things. Look at all the things, age, years, specialty, rank, productivity in a very granular way with the research, um, Medicare payments as a proxy for productivity clinically, the reputation of the place you work, and your region. And they still could not explain for 40% of the salary difference. So that leaves you wondering what other factors might exist that could account for these differences. I think that this is the most interesting study and most relevant that you might take home today. So what happens in surgery when a PCP refers a surgeon a patient and the patient dies? So look what happens. When the female surgeon's patient dies, the PCP refers fewer patients to that surgeon and all other women in that specialty. Whereas for men, good job, you tried, you cared your best for the patient, and you actually get more referrals because you, I, presumably there's just the perception of how that care was delivered was drastically different. And then when you have an unexpected survival, you took care of a very high risk patient, both men and women did get more referrals, but the men even more than the women. I think for anybody that's in practice and especially knowing all of you are entering practice, I encourage all of you to just be aware of this and be conscious of this. And um, I think that this is one of the biggest things that we need to improve upon in the culture of medicine. So how do you just correct for the pay gap? So I think that this is fascinating what OHSU did several years back. They had this university-wide initiative. And essentially, right, you can't really tell a, a, a you know, department, we're going to give the men less so that we can give the women more. Like, that's not a great way to do it. And they didn't do that. They boosted everybody's salary. They were very transparent. They adjusted for FTE. Um, they, were, you, they had a whole protocol. And they corrected the disparity. The only thing to point out is that actually cost the university $4 million to do that. So the point is it can be done, but it has to come from like the very top to try to enact these changes and it takes deep pockets to do so. So the Association of Women Surgeons put together a really great statement on ways to improve pay gap issues. So transparent compensation plans, looking beyond just RVUs to assign value to a surgeon, Publishing the data, maybe not by individual, but at least by rank and gender. So you know your gender, you know your rank, you can see if you're being paid fairly. Having performance reviews with clear metrics that are the same for everyone. And then also having, I thought this was great, checks and balances for people outside of the department. So in case there is something that isn't fair um, within the department, it might get recognized by leadership in another department. The concept of the family wages, you know, you already saw statistically that 
female surgeons are more likely to have a significant other that's a, a doctor or a surgeon. And the idea that, well, this person's spouse is a cardiothoracic surgeon, so therefore we don't need to pay her as much, whereas her male colleague's the breadwinner for the family. Like, obviously that's not fair, but that kind of culture has perpetuated for many decades. And also engaging the broader institution to try to provide resources to try to correct for this moving forward. So the last one is sort of this category that I'm calling pervasive societal expectations. So what happens when you take a gender role and flip it? It's utterly absurd, right? I don't know if anybody's seen Men Who Has It Hall, but if you're on uh, social media in any way, I encourage you to just look this up. It basically just flips the gender on um, everyday scenarios and we'll show you how ridiculous it sounds. How I feel about this personally is I feel like there is a very narrow line or tightrope that we walk as women surgeons in terms of how to behave and how to act. And that is from the moment you show up to work till the you know phone calls at night, everything that we do, there's a very fine line between being too aggressive, too assertive, words I won't use right now, or being a pushover and being unconfident. Whereas I do feel inherently for those that are in the majority, maybe that line is a little bit wider and that there's a wider accepted standard. And so I think that puts a lot of pressure on those of us who are trying to meet these expectations and that needs to be recognized by everyone. So I think there have been some really good social media um, and popular culture um, attention to uh, female surgeons. This was from um, five years ago now where the New Yorker cover showed these female surgeons and presumably anesthesiologists caring for a patient together. And this triggered this huge campaign, which I think, if not anything else, it was a huge morale booster for those of us who took the photos and posted and shared. And it really, I think, probably raised up the spirits and the hope of those who are um, junior to us that they, to encourage them to join us. So even when you look at attire, so this was a JAMA network open study that is cited on social media all the time. And basically what it shows is white coat, everybody knows that's a doctor. But what about scrubs, right? They're, so, they're a uniform, but they're also very uniform and it's kind of nondescript. So men and women were both most likely to be presumed to be a surgeon, but you can see, um, I will say I'm kind of impressed by how many people perceived a man in scrubs to be a nurse. So I also view that as progress, but you can see it was almost equal that people thought that the woman in scrubs was either a surgeon or a nurse where it was much more unequal for men. So even what we wear and those perceptions are different. So these are just kind of general thoughts that I have. So women are often told to smile. And again, like, you know, there's a certain accepted tightrope we walk that we have to be a certain way. And then it even comes down to communication. I know I am guilty of this of how I write an email. There's the exclamation point for enthusiasm, but if I put too many or a smiley face, I, I need to buffer my comments. It's like, it's going to come off as too severe unless I can buffer it. So I would encourage, these are my views as someone 10 years in practice. It's okay to do a little self-promotion because a lot of times people won't. So you, example, like you have a hard case in the OR, on Friday, everybody's there late, it was awful. When you go back on Monday, make sure to tell everybody in the room how well the patient did. They went home last night. They did well. Thank you for helping me. It was a great case. Also, Monday morning, everybody's scurrying in the OR. How many female nurses and surgeons, guilty myself, sorry, 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 you know, we're all bumping into each other. Everybody's just doing their job. Stop apologizing for trying to help. And then when somebody compliments you, just say thanks. Thanks. I appreciate that. So I was guilty of this a couple months ago. I had a patient with colon cancer. I got the scan. There was diffuse lymphadenopathy. I got a core biopsy. It turns out it's also a lymphoma. So the referring physician said, nice catch. That was really great. Instead of saying, thanks. I said, well, my husband's a lymphoma specialist. So of course I had to get that. I mean, how could I miss it? Like, just say thanks. And then I will say, just look at your emails. I'm just checking in. I'm just, I hope I'm not bothering you, but I just wanted to know if you could help me. I'm just, you know, asking, cause I haven't heard from you. Write the email and before you send, take out a couple just, take out a smiley face and you'll have more impact and you'll be more heard. So my final thoughts, just 
you know, I think that one of the biggest things we can do is to get to know each other. Don't lose your cool over some of these common perceptions. So I suck at cooking. I hate it. I constantly look for ways for other people to make food for me. But if somebody asks me to make brownies, I'm not going to lose my cool and feel like this is some kind of gender inequity. Some people like to bake. You know, if I have cute shoes, tell me because it's intentional, right? So the point is, is that if you know what makes people tick, you know what people like, that's the most important thing because that's the joy of working together as colleagues. I think that sometimes people get stuck on these gender roles and become either afraid to comment about them or they get people get very like make assumptions about what somebody may have meant. So I think it's really important just to get to know your work family and that will be the best way to create a positive culture in the workplace. So how do we start building gender equity today? So to summarize, Take deliberate action to improve your representation. Creating institutional policies before waiting for situations to exist, especially for female faculty and um, parents. Sharing or outsourcing domestic tasks. Again, it costs money, but it's an investment in your sanity and in your career. And then making conscious efforts to avoid unintentional bias against women. And then using transparency and pay structure. I want to thank my network of external mentors. There are way too many for one screen. I would encourage all of you as you build your careers to, to really seek out mentorship um, and sponsorship from colleagues across the country and worldwide. And I think this has been one of the most enriching aspects of my career. And then most importantly, I also want to acknowledge my home teams, my UMass Colorado family, and my family family, Matt, Emily, and Max. Thank you. Thank you so much for a wonderful talk. Um, certainly, I think, you know, as we all are, you know, heading into or starting our interview season, um, certainly, you know, that pay gap and that wage gap is really on our minds. And in terms of, you know, kind of politely advocating for ourselves and trying to figure out in terms of, you know, pay transparency or, you know, certainly other factors that, aren't counted for, but are really important in terms of mentorship and formal sponsorship, you know, what are good questions for us to kind of ask that and toe that line? That's a great question. And I would say, I love how you specifically said politely ask, right? Because you feel like it's, it's a taboo subject and perhaps in our lifetime that will change. I would say, I think the answer is probably different for every institution. I think that, um, Hopefully you hear something about that, but asking those who work there at different levels might be a reasonable thing to do. Uh, we have a question in the chat. In your first 10 years of practice, what have you seen fellows do that was effective in building gender equity while they were in fellowship? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, what have I seen fellows do? I mean, I think that building a network, having, I, I would say one thing that worked really well for me and for many others is, and I'm, I'm glad that many things are in person again, is building your network of people. So one of the best things you can do as you're going through, I mean, it's the most transformative three years of your life, your chief year, your fellowship year, and your first year in practice, right? And so your role changes dramatically over those three years. And so I think building a network of peers and of mentors that are both internal and external. Meaning the person that you call saying, oh my gosh, I misfired the stapler and I freaked out is gonna be a different person than I'm looking at these different jobs and I'm not sure which one's the best fit. It might be the same person, but sometimes it's nice to have different people that you can run different things by. Um, lots of people in Sir John just saying that it was an amazing and a great talk. Um, so we definitely have a fair number of people on that platform and I don't see any other questions, which means that actually for once we might wrap up a little early. Um, okay. And just a reminder for everyone uh, that we will be off for the next two weeks and that our first lecture in the new year will be troubleshooting difficult stomas uh, with Mary Ann Obst on January 8th. And I hope everyone has a really lovely holidays. Thank you.